Hey, you're listening to WSFI 88.5 FM and WNDZ 750 AM. I am Mark Kern. I'm the host of the show Cross Examination. Uh, we're coming to you with a guest today, a great uh, American, a great guy, in my opinion, Chris Miller, who is a state representative from downstate Southern Illinois. We're going to hear about essentially, you know, what's wrong with Illinois, the one party. Uh, rule and what that means for Catholics, Christians, and, and people of faith. We're really looking forward to getting into it with Chris. So before we begin, let's uh, let's begin in prayer. Chris, you want to lead us in a prayer? Sure, I'd love to. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that has not only saved us and called us to stand for truth and righteousness and to uh, overcome evil with good. Pray that you would help us to clearly communicate a vision for how to clean up this mess and pray that you put within our hearts and give us the wisdom and wherewithal and the courage to do what needs to be done. I pray that uh, thank you that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. I want to commit this time to you and we pray this in the name of our Savior, Lord Jesus. Amen. Beautiful prayer. By way of background, just uh, I can give a little bit. He's a farmer from downstate uh, southern Illinois. He's, he's also a, a cattle farmer. Uh, if anybody is interested, uh, they can make contact with Chris and you can get some great steaks sent your way and, and all kinds of other great meats. Chris is married to Mary Miller, who's one of the three Republican congressmen, only three left out of 20 in Illinois. And, uh, they met years ago. Uh, Chris was a a football standout from Southern Illinois, went on to play college football at Eureka College, the home of Ronald Reagan, who also played college football there. Being a businessman, a farmer, farmers are the most solid businessmen there are because they know what it takes to to meet a bottom line and, and all the variables that come into to being successful. There, there's so much beyond you know, weather, uh, climate, um, pesticides, and on and on. Um, Chris, you decided to run for state rep at, at some time. You, at some point, you had enough. Take it from there. Just add a little bit. I know you have a lot of children and a lot of grandchildren. We're heavily invested in Illinois, and uh, we're tied to the land. And you know, one of the things that we know is that uh, Illinois is a train wreck, both fiscally and morally. And and I know that there was an opportunity, an open seat, and I was contacted by the former state rep to see if I'd be interested in running. And um, so there was an opportunity there to actually do something besides just sitting at home and complaining about uh, how poorly our state is being run. And so, the I, I mean, I feel like the Lord opened the door for me to jump into this uh, mess and try to be a a solution oriented uh, person as we as we try to walk through this may i don't know what you want to call it maybe bs since i'm a since i right. raise goals right. i can recognize that oh no, absolutely so you know i illinois is a one party state i mean it's yeah. just i won uh when i ran for us senate i won 88 out of 102 counties i won chris's county down there which, which county is yours again uh, well, I, I represent kind of Coles and Mul or Coles and Douglas. Yeah, uh, you know. So Coles County, yeah, uh, where um, Eureka and Eastern Illinois and all that uh, are, are located, and, and then Douglas a little further um, south. So I um, I won eighty eight out of one hundred two counties when I ran for U.S. Senate back in in uh, twenty twenty, and I beat Dick Durbin in in his own county, Sagamon County, solidly. But up north, it was just a, a Democratic bloodbath. And I was at one time a Democrat, and I became a Republican. And really, it was the religious issues that drew me to the Republican Party. Um, my dad was a labor lawyer. But the issue of life, the, the Democratic Party, there's no way you can be pro-life and be a Democrat. The, the party has said that. They've run anybody out that had a pro-life position. And issues of religious liberty for Catholics out there, you know, the, the LGBTQIA movement is not independent of oppressing the, the liberty of, of people that disagree. You know, essentially, you're going to be short of what the U.S. Supreme Court did recently. They, they want bakers to have to bake, you know, obscene cakes for weddings, and they want, you know, photographers and website designers to have to do all that stuff as well. And if they don't, 
uh, well, then they're out of business. Religious liberty is at the crux of our faith, isn't it, Chris? Absolutely is. And I think that, uh, you know, we know that this battle is worth fighting for because, you know, it says in Psalm 11, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And our adversary is very, very smart because he's shooting at the very foundation and the fabric of what makes America, America. And, uh, you know, the family is the foundation of a civil society and agriculture and small business is the foundation of a stable economy. And the, all those things are under attack right now. So, Chris, how many children do you and uh, Mary have? Well, we have seven children. We have five girls and two boys. And we just welcomed our 20th grandchild here a few weeks ago. So It's great. You know, I heard the story from Mary about how you all met. It was essentially... Um, it was up in that when she was a student at Eastern Illinois, I think that you, you, know, yeah. you, you were up in that area. So having seven kids takes an element of faith, does it? You know, we ever worry that you know I can, well, maybe I can provide for four or five, but seven's too many. Did, did that come into play or no? Uh, well, not really. Every you know, every we had everybody else worried about us, and so we did. We left it up to them to worry, and we decided we were going to walk by faith. Wow. And receive as many children as God wanted to give us. Yeah, it, just the faith of both you and your wife is just such a blessing. So you've been married how many years now? We just celebrated our 43rd anniversary last Wednesday. Wow, because y'all got days ago. Yeah, you got married so young. That's that's such a beautiful thing. Most marriages end in divorce. Most Catholic marriages, I'm sure most Christian marriages end in divorce. 43 years. Can you can you make a marriage a healthy marriage like that last without the Lord? I tell you what, if it wasn't for the focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and what He wants, um, you know, we both went into this um, uh, understanding that divorce was not an option, and so it's we're good. gonna we're gonna work through it. Every every problem has a solution, and that's one thing that that. Um, I went out with Mary to D.C. this week, and a lot of the younger kids are going, you know, everybody knew it was our anniversary week, and so they're going, how did you make this work? And I think that, you know, when Mary wa Mary wants what God wants, and I want what God wants, then there, there's unity in, yeah. uh, in, the, in purpose. Right, right. So, yeah, it takes three, right? You know, yeah. The husband yeah. and the Holy Spirit. So Mary is from up north originally. She's from uh, DuPage County, suburban DuPage County. Did she give you a little inkling as to what it was like up here uh, prior to your entry into politics? Both of us, when we were younger, were pretty naive politically because we were just not really paying any attention to any of that stuff. And so, yeah. but it was, well, at that time, um, you know, uh, she graduated from one of the Naperville high schools. In that time, there was like 27, 28,000 people there. And I'm guessing back then it was probably a lot more red than it is right now. Yeah, you're right. Naperville's now well over 100,000 people. And you're right. Yeah. It, it, DuPage County became solidly blue. Lake County, where I uh, come from, is, is the second bluest county in Illinois. And it just yeah. continued to move in that direction. So seeing that... I want you to talk a little bit about what it's like being a Southern Illinoisan and essentially uh, ruled by the people way up here that really have no clue uh, what it's like, you know, for the people down down in Southern Illinois. Nor do they care. Well, that's one of the unfortunate parts about it because one of the beautiful parts of our of our Constitution and our representative republic is that we're supposed to have equal representation. OK, and so since we're in a super minority and the Democrats can force upon, I mean, they can uh, they can uh, uh, pass unfunded mandate and after unfunded mandate. And a lot of these things that we are in disagreement about is a is a violation of our moral consciousness and moral compass, which is very irritating. So most of the people down here um, uh, thrive on truth, logic, and common sense. And quite frankly, most of the people could give a hoot what the Chicago Democrats and J.B. Pritzker are up to, and we're just going to live life the way we're going to live life. And and if they if 
if there's a common theme that the people down here say is we don't want you to do anything, just leave us alone. Yes. But they just can't seem to be able to do that. Right. Limited government is, is kind of what they believe in down there. Right. You know, for example, the Second Amendment, I, I assume that virtually every single person that lives in Douglas County, Illinois, he has a gun or if not, not every single person, very few don't. And mm-hmm. you don't have any shootings down there, do you? You don't have any uh, wild, well, crazy, uh, you know, things like that. So how does it feel when you read that Chicago is essentially the murder, murder capital, uh, you know, arguably the most violent city in the world? They have all these guns and they're shooting at each other and they're killing each other. They, they have this proposal to take away guns. But the reality is they're never going to do it because there's just too many guns and we're a divided nation. There's too many people that like their Second Amendment. But when they start talking about that and, and acting as though it's not it's their not their problem, it's the whole state's problem. How does that make people down there feel? It's, it's pretty it feels pretty abusive because like you, like your observation is on the first day, warm day of spring, we don't drive around shooting each other. And almost every citizen down here where I live has some type of firearm in their home. But, but, um, you know, we're the, um, Christian influence down here where we live is, is, uh, permeated, uh, our culture for, so even that people aren't, people of faith there is um i'm trying to think there is a way uh, there's there's a measure of peer pressure on them because of the of the influence in the church down here where we live the 10 commandments where we live is still alive and well and you know it's all those things are under attack but there was a there was a plumb line when you and i were kids growing up that the church had a dynamic effect on culture at that time because people stayed married there they grew up knowing you shouldn't mm-hmm. steal that you shouldn't murder that you right. shouldn't do all these right. things but right. I, don't, I don't think yeah, when we were children you know i mean i was born in 63 you know you go back and, and look at um those early years uh marriage was divorce rate was below five percent yeah I mean, and just, even in the black fun. community, it was it was yeah, too. exactly. You no know, yeah. abortions. Yeah, like we're not just. I think there. I think that one of the keys, and I look at this, and I I think that that we really shouldn't be surprised at what we have because you know in 1961 or 62 when they took prayer out of the public school school and uh, and systematically have tried to remove God from our culture, then you begin to remove the plumb line. And um, and the line of the sand that people won't cross. And so there was a sense, you know, and since then we've been spiraling. We haven't been, been we haven't been getting better. We've been getting worse since right. they since they're right. attempting to do this. Right. So what do you, is, is there something in the DNA that's different for people that live in the, these rural communities than there is for people that live up in the in the large areas? Because the, the people couldn't be more different. And yet, you know, the, the ills that are affecting all these big cities that are not affecting, you know, the, the southern area of Illinois, the central area of Illinois. And even you take that same model and take it across the, the country. Most of the country, if you look by um, geographically, the United States is almost all red. But yeah. those <clears throat> urban areas are blue. And, and uh, what do you attribute to that in terms of are, are the people truly different? Well, I th- you know, it's hard for me to get my mind wrapped around that people are all that different because people, have, you know, they get married, they have families, they go to work, you know, people of faith, you know, attend church on Sundays and maybe sometimes during the middle of the week. And and so and and they want their kids to grow up to have the same opportunities that they have. And I don't I'm not exactly sure what the catalyst is that drives people to do the things that they do you know i think that where i live people grow up with a strong work work ethic and um you know they understand the idea if you don't work you don't eat and they want to grow up and be productive and make a positive contribution to culture and and i think that one of the 
one of the things that have driven our demise is this idea of a womb to tomb government that the government is a solution for everything where you and I both know that Jesus Christ is a solution for almost Amen. every Amen. dilemma that we have. Thank you for saying that. So I want to probe a little bit with regards to solutions that I, I think these are like ideal solutions for the people that I, I know from central and southern Illinois. Ideally, they would like to secede from the state of Illinois. They would <laughs> like to just chop off the the northern part of I-80 on up and just have the other part be maybe the 51st state. I think, they, I mean, if you were to put a poll to those people alone, I, my guess is that 95% of the southern in central Illinois, people would vote for that solution. Yeah. And you're, you were part of a group uh, that, that they called, they were not, I don't know that you all called yourself that, but uh, the reporters labeled you as the Eastern Bloc. Yeah. And it was yourself and, and uh, Darren Bailey, who, who had run for governor, and you know a number of other uh, conservative central Southern Illinois Republicans. Can you tell us a little bit about the formation of that group? I, I'm trying to remember the other fellow that really wanted uh, to secede. He kept pushing it forward. Oh, and, probably probably Brad Hallbrook. Brad Hallbrook, exactly right. Thank you. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Um, it, well, it's something that got a lot of press for inside, for inside yeah. baseball, those of us that are in the know. But some of our listeners up here in the North, they probably never oblivious to this ever happening. The media is all if you're over the target the media is always shooting at you and what they what they labeled us as was the eastern bloc i assume that that meant because they thought that we were a bunch of radicals but but um but the kind of like comparing you to the soviet right i mean uh, yeah i I would guess that that was it most of the people down here they really like that because and the the reason why it fit is is you most of the y'all were uh, essentially on the eastern half of the state yeah. way down south all right. all right well the thing about the thing that we have that we have continually tried to do is to draw our party back to the word of god the constitution and the republican party platform and those three defining documents basically are our plumb line of of governing and we we're doing our best to stay true to to those ideals that make America America, and when you think about the ideas that drive the way we, why we do what we do, they're they're ideals that make America America. Because when you think about individual liberty, about limited government, about the rule of law, about fiscal responsibility, fair markets, the precious sanctity of life, and peace through strength, those are all ideals that 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 many, many, many Americans fought and bled and died so that we could live free. And uh, the oppression of the government keeps pressing in and keeps attacking those very ideals that make us who we are. And if you think about it, you know, Abraham Lincoln made the, con- uh, the observation that we were conceived in liberty. And when I think about the, that, I, that idea of conception, there was a seed planted in the heart of American patriots that we could be free, that we could self-government, that we could do all the things that if we are students of history that know that down through the ages, these are the reasons why, that we, have, why we have fought so uh, vigorously to maintain our freedoms. And now we see them eroding away and it's, and it's something that we're willing to take a stand and willing to fight for. We're, we're willing to take the arrows and the bullets for the people. Yes, yes. In in as a result, you y'all are your Eastern Bloc, if you will, are, are incredibly popular uh, representatives down in uh, in their districts down there. Where does it where does it go from there? You know, I mean, what what can you do as somebody that represents Central or Southern Illinois and you know, essentially you're, you're paying for Chicago and you're paying for the Collar counties and all these programs that you don't want. And you're paying for, uh, you, you know, essentially their schools and you're being limited in terms of your ability to govern. Where, where does it go from there as somebody that represents that? Uh, demo? Well, I think that one of the things that we understand is we aren't going to get any significant reforms passed uh, because the Democrats really aren't interested in a more transparent government. And so 
the thing that we feel like that we can do is we can message and we can expose, we can peel back the layers of the onion and let the other citizen, the citizens of Illinois know what's going on. And one of the ways we do that is that we have formed a Illinois Freedom Caucus, which is umbilical to the Freedom Caucus in Washington, D.C. And we have support, we have staff, we have the ability to message, and, uh, and there's also other states that are adopting these same thing. I think there's 11 or 12 states that have established freedom caucuses. And I know that we've, I think that we've done, we try to do a Tuesday night town hall every week uh, that we broadcast live on Facebook and other social media platforms just to inform the people what's really going on because the Democrats lie with impunity because they know that they, that the press is not going to hold their feet to the fire. And so that's one thing that we're trying to aggressively do. I know that we have, we've had several town halls throughout the state of Illinois. And I know we got one coming up in Rockford, one over in the, in the um, Quad City area, and then one down in, in Marion, Illinois, in the deep Southern Illinois coming up here in the near future. But we try it, but we've been fairly consistent on, um, on doing that every Tuesday night. But these, the three that I just mentioned will be live town halls in those areas. We did one the other day up, um, up in your neck of the woods. Up in I've seen the, the postings and watched some of the freedom yeah. Caucus and you're doing great work. So one thing that, you know, somebody from up this way, the Chicago area, the Chicago collar counties would really have a hard time understanding is the fact that during COVID, Central and Southern Illinois, for the most part, were open for business. I, <laughs> I couldn't go anywhere up here because everything was closed. There were no parades. There wasn't any restaurants. The only thing that was allowed to be open was the big box uh, stores. You know, of course, you know, the, the huge corporations get everything they want, but nobody else gets does. So they were open, uh, but nothing else was. So campaigning was very difficult. Central and Southern Illinois, you know, we're having, you know, Taverns were open, the restaurants were open, everything. They were just, they weren't following the mandate, if you will. Um, how did that come about? And were any, did they face any consequences, any repercussions? Well, I know that this, uh, where we live, like I said, is the home of truth, logic, and common sense. And I know that one of the things that I did, even from the beginning, is I tried to look at the historical data, the death rate over the last 10 years in the USA and different different measurable outcomes. And I concluded in my own heart that this was the I hate Donald Trump coronavirus response, because even if you just look back at the last 10 years of the death rate in the United States of America, that number is pretty static across the board. There were no great increases. It's just that nobody died from anything take else it, but yeah. coronavirus. Take, take the uh, the absence of the flu virus moving into this other column. Right. And, uh, you know, fatalities were really not any different. Well, see, what, what another thing you might, this will put a smile on your face, but down here mm -hmm. I know that there's a very popular restaurant that serves a lot of people and, of course, uh, they didn't wear masks. They didn't wear gloves. They just did a business as usual. So our blessed governor sent the state police down to give them a ticket. And, uh, well, they gave them an opportunity. They said, we'll be back in a few hours and uh, to give you a chance to mask up and glove up and all these things. And so they came back. And, of course, they didn't do anything. And so they wrote them. I think it was a $2,500 ticket. And the lady took it down to the to the Douglas County state's attorney and he, he uh, tore it up and threw it in the garbage. <laughs> so wow, it's beautiful. That's how, that's how we yeah, roll. I love it. Oh, I love hearing stories like that, Chris, because there, you know, there's a couple taverns up in Chicago that, that they tried to like dance around it. McNeil yeah. is I think of on the South, uh, Southwest side, Beverly area. And they tried to stay open. And they, I mean, the city of Chicago went in and just, you know, wrote them, ticket after ticket and of course yeah. Ken Fox is going to prosecute that and so they don't, don't have the liberty or the freedom that y'all have mm -hmm. um so i guess very very interesting so you you uh stayed open during the coronavirus um central and southern illinois and it's not just illinois but you see this this 
rural versus urban fight going on across the United States and all kinds of different states. And I'm just wondering, are we on the precipice of a, of a civil war or what's going to happen? I just, I mean, you, and you, I've, because I say that and I ask that question immediately, the left or the media that the, is comes from the left is going to, you know, think wacko, you know, blah, 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 silly, blah, blah, blah. Well, just look at history. I mean, right. we had, you know, nations don't last forever. And eventually right. the people rise up and not, eventually there's battles and there's bloodshed and people stand, take one side or the other. And I think the United States is close to that. I'm not a, I don't have a crystal ball or anything, but, it, it, but as a student of history, I believe that we're close to that. Do you see that, that, that if they keep pushing, um, there's going to be bloodshed? I hope that cool heads will prevail. Um when it comes to re in regard to that, because I, you know, going to um, a civil war here in the United States would be catastrophic, and I don't think it's a solution. You know, I think that I think that we have to go as far as we can to avoid any uh, armed conflict like that. I I think it would be disastrous, and plus, I think that's exactly what the left wants, because then they can come in and declare martial law and start killing right. all those conservatives all right their no. opponents. yeah i agree with you and i mean just by way of personal i'm, I'm more of a paleo kind of anything i i'm not very much of an anti-war guy but um i i just think that there is a threshold or a limit that they're at some point they just keep they don't the the dna as we started right. the show with before of people up here and people in central and southern Illinois is, is very different. I mean, it's the rural people that, that sign up for the military, you know, by and large yeah. in much higher percentages. And they're just not, they're not wired the same way. They're not just, you know, they're not wired to just, yes, the government said this, therefore I'm just going to do it. No, yeah. they, they don't think that way. So we'll see what happens. And I agree with you hundred percent that um, the worst thing that could happen would be a civil war. So um, Chrissy, your wife, Mary Miller, is one of uh, three congressmen, congresswomen, congresspersons that represent Illinois. What's her experience been like? She's now uh, in her second term. And uh, what's her take on it, if you will? Well, we have a problem with Democrats with their tax borrow spend policy, over regulation, and, and you know, the, the list goes on and on. But one of the biggest... One of, in my opinion, one of the biggest problems here in Illinois and in our nation is squishy Republicans that don't have a backbone to stand up and do what's right, to follow the Constitution, to follow the party platform. And, you know, and one of our founders made the observation that our Constitution was written for a, a religious and a moral people. Johnny Adams. Yeah. And when those things, when that's not happening, it's really hard to have good. Totally. So let's talk a little bit about those. Um, you know, you, you had a former um, speak, minority, House Minority Leader, and they voted him out, and they voted the the, the Senate uh, Minority Leader out as well. And in, it seemed as though those guys made a lot of money in being in politics. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, one's a lawyer, and his firm was able to get a lot of money, and and um, played cozy, cozy with, with the uh, school boards and what have you. That's kind of been the Chicago mantra forever. Yeah. That get into politics because it's a good living. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in politics, chances are you could rise up in, in city government, in the police department, in the fire department. You can rise up. If you're a lawyer, there's no better fit because um, you're going to see – you know, what firms get that legislation and people will hire you because they can't afford the taxes and they think that you have juice that other lawyers don't, uh, you know, which is a real crime. When you think of Ed Burke and Mike Madigan having made all those millions of dollars on, on fighting property taxes and property tax appeals over the years when they were the most responsible for it. It's just, but that's been the mantra. I'm, I'm going to go into government because that's that's a great way for me to make money as a lawyer. And it's just flooded with lawyers too, isn't it? Talk to them. Yeah. It's got to just churn you terribly. For sale, that govern, govern, the government is a good place to, to make a lot of money. But I know that... Uh, Myself and the, my other colleagues are in, a, in the Illinois Freedom Caucus are not for sale. 
we aren't we aren't bellied up to the big government uh, golden parachute and the pension that's completely out of um, out of line for the work that we do for a public servant. But I know that that uh, you know it's like that I've said from the beginning. I am not going to be intimidated, and you aren't going to buy me. And so I have very, very, a very, very few lobbyists that stop by my office because they've learned that that I'm not for sale. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, if you if you put your shingle out and they know that you're for sale, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty alarming the kind of money that they get. I'm Chris, and I'm a lawyer. You know, I'm 34 years out of law school or something like that, and. I think back on you know the history of Illinois government, and it's my humble opinion that the people that should not be leading the Illinois government at all are lawyers. I, I don't. Sure. I think I think that we're the most compromised profession that there is. I mean, we have yeah. we have the most liberal tort laws in the nation, the most liberal workmen's comp laws in the nation. We and you can go right down the list and. Uh, there's so many opportunities for lawyers to make money out of government. You know, we're going to point mm-hmm. at this. We're going to, you know, we need a lawyer to represent this agency or that agency. There's so many giveaways. And in Illinois, up until very recently, a judge who is their pay is just incredible I and mean, well over $200,000 now a year. Uh, no other state pays judges like that. A yeah. judge served 20 years. And at the end of 20 years, they get 85% of their salary with sure. cost of living increases forever and with sure. he- lifetime health care. I mean, oh, my gosh, how is that public service? It's just nobody nobody lives that fat. And, sure. um, but they do it in this lawyer-friendly state. I mean, I, I, would you agree with me? We just don't want any lawyers anywhere in, in Illinois government. And I, I'll, put, I'll say that for myself. I mean, there's offices yeah. I think I can run for, like I was sheriff and, you know, national office and what have you. And then Supreme Court, you need a lawyer. But other than that, there should, a lawyer should not be the head of either the, the senator or the Democrat Republican Party. And, and it's just they're bad for, for business. Well, I think that I think that. Um, I agree and I disagree both in the same time, and I'll tell you why is because I think of it our our constitution was written for people from diverse backgrounds, which would include lawyers yeah. and farmers and and small business owners to come and take their turn. The biggest the biggest problem I see is rather than coming and take your turn and going back home and going back to your job is people come and they stay. It's just like Mike Madigan, one of the reasons why the corruption ran so deep was because he was there for 50 years. And I think the longer you stay, the the swamp turns into a hot tub and, and you begin to like it way too much. Yeah, no, I, I think you're exactly right. Term limits is, is absolutely critical. And even if uh, you know we're not going to be able to get that through the Illinois General Assembly, I think Republicans should lead on that. That at some point yeah. you know, somebody's been in the House or Senate too long, say, "Hey, you know what? We don't want you in leadership anymore. You, you're, if you're going to run, we can't control that. But it's time for you to, you know, stop uh, dictating." And I think you're right that you know there are lawyers that bring a, a good perspective. I, I my point, I suppose, is just that there are way too many of them, and there has been way too many of them, and that's one of the big problems that Illinois has had. So, Chris, um, is there hope for Illinois? And if, oh, so, I think that and if so, why? I think that there's always hope. And I know that um, um, I sent your colleague a, a, a map of Illinois broken down pre- precinct by precinct. And it's pretty incredible. The land mass that is bright, bright, ruby red and the small little spots here and there that are blue. But I think that the thing that I look at that gives me hope is one thing is that we have almost three three million FOID card holders, which is enough votes to win any statewide election. Another thing that gives me hope is that there were two million uh, registered voters in Illinois that didn't vote in the last election, and so that gives me hope to and you know to mobilize those people. Another thing that gives me hope is there was only 
50, it's either 52 or 54 percent of registered voters even bothered, re registered Republicans even bothered to go vote in this last election. And so if you take that number and you can bump that to the mid 70 percent would be turning out the vote, then we can win every statewide election that there is. And there's enough data that in each precinct, every precinct committeeman ought to know how many votes that their candidates need to win. And with the databases that are available, there's really, and the extended voting time and the mail-in ballots and the legal ballot harvesting and all those mechanisms can be used to our benefit, but we have to be smart in our strategies. We have to be diligent to go out and get it done. Uh, but there's, you know, so when you, when you break it down you know, there's approximately 10,000 precincts in the state of Illinois, uh, give or take. But that if you get if you if you know that you need 2.5 million votes to win a state light election, then you you go out into your precincts and you make sure that you collect that many votes to get it done. But doing the same thing that we've been doing, we're going to get the same results that we've always gotten. So it's important to develop a different strategy. Point well taken. So moving away from Illinois and into the national, um, what is uh, your thought on this pre upcoming presidential and what, from a, a religious Christian perspective, what, uh, what do you, how do you feel about the candidates? Well, I think that one thing is very obvious that based on the performance of the, the, the Democrats and the way they have abused the American citizenry and to put us into a stale spin. It's obviously, it's obvious to me that we need a Republican president, a Republican house and a Republican Senate to try to clean up this mess. And, um, you know, the thing that I don't understand about y'all up there is the people down where we live, we love a booming economy. We love, uh, energy independence, and we love border security. And those three gr huge issues are three things that Donald Trump did during his presidency. And and I'm not sure why we embrace those ideals down here. And it yeah. seems like there's a lot of well, pushback up where you all live. Right. And I'm familiar with the term y'all. I went to college in, in Mobile, Alabama. So um, he, I, I saw the... the schism, if you will, many years before now. Chicago's city council, the most popular candidates are, represent the socialist, uh, you know, they label themselves as socialists. Yeah. So, you know, they don't really understand anything about economics. I mean, they probably went, when they went to college, they probably thought, you know, taking an economics course was was just uh, for the, the pigs of the world. And um, as far as, you know, border security, I'm somebody that you know, you go back to 2013 when they had that bill. I thought they should have passed that bipartisan bill because we are a, a divided nation and, you know, we're never going to get the perfect. And, and there was a lot of, in that bill that was good for border security, but it would have left some of the people here with the permanent status. And, you know, we didn't do that. So now we left the borders wide open. Now I, I don't understand it at all. It's just, I mean, the, the, you're right. The immigration is destroying the country. You talk about the uh sex trafficking and, and all that have you have you gotten the opportunity to see that movie uh sound of freedom yes i have we actually spent some time with uh tim wednesday when we were were out there the guy that the movie's about so yeah and uh so that's that's a result of our immigration just the immoral nature of our immigration policies right now just terrible and we no nation without borders is, it will ever survive. And that's another reason why there's, sure. yeah, very, very dangerous times for America. You know, your, your last uh, point, you know, the, the uh, energy independence, I mean, they believe in this, uh, that essentially the world's going to be gone in a couple of years if we don't, <laughs> if we don't uh, do all these different things. And they, they don't understand that the climates have a natural uh, change about it. And even in the Catholic church, I would submit to, um, the listeners out there, there's a wonderful book written by Charles Rice, who was a longtime uh, law professor at Notre Dame, called 50 Questions of Natural Law. And 
the worship of the earth is demonic. It's absolutely mm-hmm. demonic. And the earth is there for us. We're called to be good stewards, um, but we need to you know, trust in God. And, and these irrational policies are absolutely ludicrous. One of the reasons why that we have the lifestyle we have is because of cheap, affordable, reliable energy. We've created this monster called the Seja. And one of the one of the observations that President Reagan made was the most terrifying words in the English language was, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. We've created this mess and now we're on the Fourth Amendment to try to clean it up. You know, I work outside every day. I work in the environment. You know, it's 100 degrees in the shade and 90% humidity. I don't sit around and whine about it being hot. When it's a winter time and I'm out feeding the cows and it's 20 below zero, I'm not whining about it being cold. And we've created a complete myth that is destroying the economy in Illinois and eventually will destroy the economy in the United States of America if we continue down this rabbit trail. You know, before Seja happened, myself, Representative Hallbrook, Representative Calkins, we actually went on the energy tour and we visited the Prairie State campus. We visited Hamilton Coal. We visited the nuclear power plant in Clinton. We visited the wind farms, we visited the solar fields, and we made a decision based on information and not our emotions or how we feel. I know one of the things that we found out at these energy producing plants, that everyone was running about almost 100% capacity. And at that time, we knew that there was no way in the world we could shut down our, our existing power and t- still power our grid. And the net result of it is a, was a war on the middle class and people could no longer afford to pay their doggone electric bills because of bad public policy. I know one thing about it, for the last 69 years, we've had a climate crisis and we've gone from one thing to the other. When I was a kid, we had global cooling. We're gonna have the great freeze out and, and four billion people were going to die. And then we went to global warming where the earth was going to return to a, turn into a frying pan and we were all going to burn up. And now we're on this myth we call climate change. And now we're all going to change to death. One of the common threads that links all of these ideas together is none of it ever happened. And guess what? None of it is ever going to happen. We aren't going to be destroyed by CO2. And I would suggest that probably most of the people in this body don't even know what carbon dioxide is. Here's a good dose of it. There's a little carbon dioxide for you. And guess what? Nobody's going to die. <laughs> Representative, um... <laughs> uh, rep- Does anybody know how much carbon dioxide is in the entire globe? And I guess and probably nobody can answer that question. There's four hundredths of one percent of the entire world atmosphere is made up of carbon dioxide. During the Obama administration, the EPA said if we do everything that we want to do by the year 2100, that, that we will increase the global temperature by two one hundredths of one percent of a degree. It doesn't amount to jack squat. There's one thing that I know is in sound science, Your observation dictates your conclusion, and I know I have 69 years of observation, and I have come to the conclusion that this is a bunch of bunk, and we need to throw this all in the garbage. One of the things that we, that I understand is I understand earth science as a farmer. And there's a great mechanism that we call photosynthesis. It's an incredible, it's an incredible way that we clean up the atmosphere. Guess what? We have millions of acres of green leafy plants that absorb carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. It's amazing, it's incredible. Another thing it takes out of the atmosphere is sulfur. And guess what? We've taken so much sulfur out of the atmosphere. Now as a farmer, I have to buy sulfur to put in my fertilizer mixes so I can grow the maximum production in corn. There's one thing that I know 
is our biggest threat to civilization is not climate change. But I know a lot of times that I think that our biggest threat to, to civilization is the hot air that gets produced in this General Assembly by passing bad public policy. No one can change the weather, not Joe Biden, not Barack Obama, not J.B. Prisker, not John Kerry. They cannot change the climate. People do what they really believe. And when you see these guys flying around the world in their private jets, they live in mansions on the beach, if they actually thought the world was doomed because of climate change, they would have a different lifestyle. Part of the lie is convincing you that electricity comes from magic. We wave our magic wand and all of a sudden we produce electricity and it's just not true. We are not having a climate crisis, but what we are having is we are having a crisis of common sense. And the only way we're on the Fourth Amendment to this bill and the only way to fix it is to have Amendment Number 5 and throw CJ in the garbage and start over. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I think it's when we elevate the earth in terms of an idolatry and that that's essentially what we do, we get into a lot of trouble. And so, you know, the yeah. Democratic Party, as you mentioned, in recent history, they have they, they play on fears and they and they, they recognize the fact that father so and so is really not bright enough to delve deeply into the uh into whether or not there is a, what's going on as far as global warming, which is now climate change. Sure. And so that he's going to be easily led, and then he's going to get up on the pulpit and talk about that. We are called to be good stewards. We're called to be good stewards within reason. But th this business about the earth is no longer going to be here in a few years. Right. I mean, that is that is totally demonic, and it's, mm. it's used by the devil to to put fear, irrational fears, in in the minds of Christians. Um, so that that's my take on why we, we have those issues up there. You have a, a congressional race down there, Darren Bailey, that um, ran for governor. He's a friend of mine, good guy. Um, and then Mike Boss, who's been in a long time, he's a Marine, also a good guy. Is, are the Millers in, interested in that race, or just trying to stay out of the hole? Well, I know that I know that when um, when the when Congress held out for better rules when before naming uh, McCarthy to be speaker, yes. I know that part of the negotiation process on, on that was that Republicans aren't going to get involved in primaries when right. there's Republican on Republican. Yeah, so, I, I respect that. And, you know, it's, I, I mean, I probably, would, I like Darren because he did a lot for me when I ran for um, U.S. Senate, but uh it's hard to say Mike Boss is a bad guy either. <laughs> so it, right. it can. what else can you give us as far as a Capitol Hill update, if, if you don't mind, um, you know, being the, the love of your life is there in, in Washington, D.C.? You're on break right now, aren't, you, aren't they? Yesterday evening. They were supposed to be there today, but they canceled both today. And so we came we came home last night. How, and, do, you, um, how do you like going out to D.C.? Oh, city, I, isn't I it? actually, I kind of enjoy it because I know that um, on fly-in day, the, the Freedom Caucus always has a dinner and kind of a spitball uh, session where, you know, strategizing for the week coming up, for the bills that are going to be debated and talked about, and just to kind of give it an overview of what's happening so that you can be winsome in your strategies and Try to move the needle for the benefit of the American people. Yeah, I, I to me it's probably my favorite city in the world to walk. Right. You know, and just to no, meet. I really and I really enjoy going out there uh, just because over time you develop friendships and get to see people and and I know the Conservative Partnership Institute is a place where people can where they have meetings and you can go to visit with people and renew old acquaintances and so that's all it's all good yeah you need to be supported no doubt about that so how about illinois is there any legislation that you see coming up shortly that is concerning for for people of faith oh just about everything they do is concerning for people of faith because they they continue to trample on the on the moral fabric of us as christians um whether it be through the the, the indoctrination of our children for the perverted sex curriculum through 
all kinds of things, uh, abortion up to after, even after a baby's born. I mean, all these things are just in, they don't go away. Yeah. They don't, they don't go away. It's like red meat for their base, isn't it? Right. I mean, the thing that I, that I don't understand is, you know, one of the things that, that uh, motivates me is that I know that, you know, it talks about in the scriptures that it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. And I would hate to be a legislator that voted for all this stuff and stand before a holy God and trying to explain your position. I got a feeling that that's not going to work out very well for you. Right, right. Absolutely. And we we each have an individual judgment. I mean, you can't just hide yourself and say, well, I was a Democrat. Yeah, you aren't going to be able to blame the party or whatever. You aren't going to be able to blame anybody. Right, exactly right. So um, you've been listening to WSFI, Catholic Radio, 88.5 FM, 7.50 AM WNDZ. Our guest has been Chris Miller, just a wonderful person, a wonderful guest, a wonderful guy. He's the husband of Mary Miller, one of only three Congress people left in Illinois that represent the Republican Party. Illinois, a uh, one-party state, folks. So, you know, you can talk all you want about the Republicans, but we have they have no power. Fortunately, they have courageous people like Chris Miller that are not afraid to make enemies that stand up on the floor and give terrific speeches all the time, telling people what's going on so that, that at least um, you know that somebody's out there fighting for you, even if, if they're outnumbered and outgunned. Um, Chris, I, I just want to wrap it up with uh, Chris was a football player, college football player, Um and he came up for our sports faith banquet and saw the impact. And, he, and he's probably as aware as anyone about the impact that, that sports have on, on young people. You know, mm-hmm. football, for example, they're telling it's too dangerous. And up here with all the soccer moms, as they're called, that you know, helicopter parents and what have you, they don't want junior to play football. Really, and then you you have the uh, the label toxic male, anybody that's masculine in any sense. You know, we need to get rid of the John Waynes of the world. We all need to be like uh, Pee Wee Herman or or something like that. So what do you, what lessons would you say that, that are so critical uh, that are learned in sports that carry over in, into uh, people's lives and are, are absolutely essential for Christians and warriors? Well, I think that there's one thing that you are continually trying to, trying to do is to uh, – is to elevate your game to the next level. So you're always trying to improve and find uh, ways to get better, bigger, stronger, faster. And, and uh, there's a lot of sweat equity <laughs> involved in that. And um, you learn how to push through hard times because not every, not every play is a perfect play and not, you know, and so you can't get, too high if you have a good play and you can't get too low if you know your quarterback gets sacked and your guy got him you know it's just you just have to roll it up you have to live in play tight compartments and fight the battle on that play and then move on to the next play but the whole, ultimately you want to keep moving you want to keep it advancing up the hill and getting better both individually and as a team amen amen we'll leave it with that chris thank you so much linda press here is our producer and linda always does a terrific job and you know god bless you brother thank you for having me i appreciate it thank you so much chris you're awesome